The Buddha had great power to subdue the Germans and external parts. He also subdued greed and desire. Love is the hardest thing to subdue. It makes people live like a drunkard and die in a dream. If you can't get rid of it, you can't get rid of your outflows. You have outflows because you have love and emotion. Living beings are confused by emotion. Having karma and confused emotions make a living being. Karma ended and emotion emptied, that is the Buddha. Buddhas become Buddhas because they have ended love and emotion. Living beings are living beings because of having love and emotion. Because of it, they are unable to escape bondage on the will of birth and death, and they flow out into the free realm. Without outflows, the sea of suffering is boundless. A turn of the head is the other shore that is liberation from worldly greed and outflows. Sutra, I placed myself on the Buddha's teaching of precepts, encompassing the 3,000 awesome departments and the 80,000 subtle aspects. Both my direct karma and my contributing karma became pure. My body and mind became tranquil and I accomplished a hardship. Commentary I based myself on the Buddha's teaching of precepts. You probably accompanied the Buddha in person when the Buddha left the home life. He himself saw the Buddha cultivate ascetic practices for six years in the Himalayas. He himself saw the Buddha sit beneath the Bodhi tree, see a star one night and awaken to the way. He himself saw the Buddha subdue the demons and control attendants of external paths and so forth until he accomplished Buddhahood. You probably witnessed all of it. After Shakyamuni Buddha accomplished the way and began teaching, he saw that the venerable you probably had been foremost in holding precepts in the assemblies of the limitless Buddhas of the past. When Shakyamuni Buddha came to the Sah world this time, and accomplished Buddhahood. The Venerable Yupali came to this world at the same time. So the Buddha told him to concentrate on the cultivation of the precepts within the Buddha Dharma. I will speak about the precepts now and all of you students of Buddha Dharma should take notes. First are the five precepts. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit sexual misconduct, do not lie, do not take intoxicants. Next are the eight precepts, which include the five precepts already listed together with do not adorn the body with flowers, fragrances, beads, and fragrant oils. Do not use a high, grand, or big bed, and do not look at, listen to, or, or participate in musical entertainment. By not sleeping in a grand bed, you train yourself not to be arrogant. And do not eat at improper times. Not eating at improper times means not eating after noon. Not eating after noon helps train you against greed because if you can eat any time you want and you will simply want to eat all the time, lay people can take these precepts. Novices have 10 precepts which cannot be taken by lay people. It is not the case that after taking the 5 precepts you are considered a, a member of the Sangha. Taking the 8 precepts does not classify one as a member of the Sangha, nor does receiving the 10 major and 48 minor Bodhisattva precepts. To be a member of the Sangha, you must first take the 10 Shravanura precepts, then the 250 Vishu precepts, on the 348 Bishuni precepts and then the 10 major and 48 minor Bodhisattva precepts. It's not the case that just because this is America, you can decide to do things in a new and different way. You can't just create a new universe and say everyone is a member of the Sangha. I've heard it said that even the tables and chairs are members of the Sangha. Cups, bowls, chopsticks, plates and silverware Everything's the Sangha. This is ridiculous. It's unspeakably wonderful. In that case, nothing in the world would not be the Sangha. If everything in the world were the Sangha, 
Then, why do the Sangha have to assemble together? I think it is something I've never seen or heard of before. It's truly unprecedented. The word preset is uh, Pratimoksha in Sanskrit. It is also called Shila. The meaning is to stop evil and guard against the transgressions. Don't do any evil. Offer up on good conduct. Once an elderly Upasaka asked an elderly Bodhisattva, a person who had left the home life for a long time, how to cultivate the way, the high monk said to him, You should not do any evil and offer up on good conduct. The elderly Upasaka said, I needed you to tell me that. Even a three-year-old knows that phrase. The high monk replied, A three-year-old child may know the words, but most 80 year olds can't put them into practice. In this day and age, a lot of people set up groups and call themselves a Sangha. You should find out how many precepts they have received. If they have not taken the complete precepts, they cannot refer to themselves as Sangha. If they protest and say that they are new and different, then they should not call themselves Buddhists. If they do not venerate and adhere it, adhere to the long-standing rules and precepts of Buddhism. What kind of Buddhists are they? New Buddhists, they reply, then ask them, ask them, what's new about them? The Buddha himself could speak Dharma in their heavens. He could speak Dharma in their house. He could proclaim the Dharma among people and go to the dragon palaces to teach. Where can this new Buddhist speak Dharma? Ask them that. That's myth, they may reply. Of course, we can't go there. You can create your own myths. You can be living myths. If any one of them had the abilities of a certain one of my disciples present in this assembly, who has opened his five eyes, they still would not have to write to change the structure of the Buddha Dharma, and they don't have nearly as much talent. What right do they have to answer Buddhism? When you go to into business, you have to have some capital. If you want to be a high official in government, you have to be a college graduate. If these people decide to be new Buddhists, what is their foundation? What they retort is, we teach the Buddha the Buddha's four truths, the six paramitas, and the twelve conditioned rings, and we use the Buddhist mantras. We recite the sutras of the Buddha. Then ask them, if you recite the Buddhist sutras and recite the Buddhist mantras, in what way are you new? It's too paradoxical. I hope you young American students will strive to counteract this mistake. Otherwise, the decline of the Dharma is imminent. Shakyamuni Buddha himself predicted that in the Dharma ending age, the children and grandchildren of the demons would come into the world in full force, and when Shakyamuni Buddha subdued the demon kings and controlled the adherence of external paths, the demon Po soon confirmed this. He said, I can't get at you right now, but in the future I will certainly destroy your teaching. How will you manage to do that? inquired the Buddha. I will have my children and grandchildren enter your religion. Eat your food, wear your clothes, and sully your vessels with excrement and urine. They will destroy your religion from within. From within, because of them, no one will believe you. Now is the time that he spoke of. Shakyamuni Buddha long ago saw that is taking place today. They will wear the Buddha's clothes. They will eat the Buddha's food. But within Buddhism, they won't do the Buddha's work. Among the Buddha's disciples, the Venerable Yupali was foremost in holding precepts. The Buddhism there are Vinaya masters who specialize in maintaining the precepts, and there are Dharma masters who explain the sutras and speak the Dharma. Dharma master who has two meanings, one who gives the Dharma to others and one who takes the Dharma as master. They are also teaching masters who investigate the teachings and they are dhyana masters 
who investigate transit in meditation. When the Buddha was in the world, people relied on the Buddha as their teacher. When the Buddha left the world, he instructed the bishops and bishonis to take the precepts as their teacher. So the most important thing for them is to guard the precepts. Vinaya masters such as the Venerable Yupali specialize in this. He says, I based myself on the Buddha's teaching of precepts and compassing the 3,000 awesome departments to determine the meaning of 3,000 awesome departments. You calculate the 250 Vishru precepts with regard to walking, the 250 precepts with regard to sitting, the 250 precepts with regard to standing, and the 250 precepts with regarding to lying down. That's total 1,000 awesome departments, which it multiplied by the three commas of body, mouth, and mind, make 3,000. Each of the four great awesome departments of walking, sitting, standing, and lying down it has its particular aspect. One, walk like the wind. This wind does not refer to a hurricane, but to a gentle breeze as a fear. One should walk in a slow and stately manner and not be impulsive and rush around recklessly. Two, stand like a pine, stand up straight like a pine tree and do not slouch and lean this way or that. Three, sit like a bell. This refers to a huge heavy bell that of old that hung solid and unmoving. Four, lie like a bow. Like a bow, one should lie down in the auspicious lying down position. Lie on your right side with your right hand under your cheek and your left hand resting on your left thigh. The 80,000 subtle aspects. 80,000 is a round figure. It refers to the, the 84,000 aspects of conduct. This figure is derived by multiplying the, the departments of the three commas of body, mouth, and might by their seven branches greed, hatred, stupidity, killing, stealing, lying, harsh speech, loose speech, and gossip, making 21,000, and multiplying them by the four afflictions greed, hatred, stupidity, and sum of each. That is what the 80,000 subtle aspects refer to. I have held these aspects, continues the Venerable Yupali. And both in my direct karma and my contributing karma became pure. Direct karma refers to the four fundamental prohibitions, killing, stealing, lust, and lying. Any of these acts is fundamentally wrong and in the direct violation. If one commits one of these four prohibited deeds, there is no chance of repentance. That's what is said. But if you actually violate one of these precepts and you firmly resolve, to change your ways, you still have a chance. Contributing karma refers to acts which lead you to commit offenses which you basically would never have committed. For instance, there was once a person who received the five precepts but eventually he found it hard to guard them and decided one day that it wouldn't hurt if he took a little drink or wine. I can see the sense in holding to the precepts against the killing, stealing, lust, and lying, but I don't think it would matter to transgress the prohibition against alcohol. He rationalized. So he went out and bought some brandy, or perhaps it was whiskey. He got back home with a bottle, but then realized he didn't have any appetizers to accompany the drink. A little fried chicken to choice this whiskey would be great, he mused. Just as he thought that the neighbor's chicken straight into his, his yard, glancing quickly to the left and right and finding no one looking, he snatched up the pullet, thereby violating the precept against stealing. Then he lopped off the chicken's head, breaking the precept against killing engrossed in his whiskey and fried chicken. He noticed the neighbor, the neighbor lady approaching. I lost one of my chickens, he said. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it, he denied. 
thereby violating the precept against lying. Then he took a second look at the woman. Although she wasn't stunning, she was certainly possible. His lust arose, and he had his way with her. All that happened because he violated the precept against taking intoxicants. That's how contributing karma works. This is also why he said that eating meat is a violation of the precept against killing. If you didn't eat meat, you wouldn't have any connection with the slaughter, slaughter of animals. The same goes for cultivating the earth. People who strictly adhere to the precepts do not blow the earth, because in doing so, you can kill many living beings. These are all examples of contributing karma. The venerable Yupali explains, "I upheld the precepts until all aspects of my karma were purified." My body and mind became tranquil, and I accomplished a hardship. When extreme purity was reached, I was certified to the fruition of sagehood. Sutra in the Third Commons Assembly, I am a governor of the law. The Buddha himself certified my mind's upholding of the precepts and my genuine cultivation of them. I am considered a leader of the assembly. Commentary in the first commons assembly. I am a governor of the law. He was a superior seated one, a leader of the assembly, who was a model for everyone exemplary in the Dharma. Multitudes of people studied with him. The precepts were governed by the venerable Yupali. The Buddha himself certified my mind's upholding of the precepts and my genuine cultivation of them. The world honored one personally verified my vigor in upholding the precepts. I firmly maintained the precepts and cultivated according to them. I am considered a leader of the assembly since I am foremost in holding the precepts. Sutra: The Buddha asks about perfect penetration. I disciplined the body until the body attained ease and comfort. Then I, I disciplined the mind until the mind attained penetrating clarity. After that, the body and mind experienced keen and thorough absorption. Absorption. This is the foremost method. Commentary. The Buddha asks about perfect penetration. He wants to know which of us has achieved it. I disciplined the body until the body attained ease and comfort. I upheld the precepts in order to cultivate the body. Then I disciplined the mind until the mind attained penetrating clarity. When I had cultivated the body to the point that I did not transgress the precepts involving the body, I then cultivated the mind. I maintained the precepts in my mind. The precepts involving the body belong to the practices of the arhats of the small vehicle. Precepting the mind is what Bodhisattvas do. Bodhisattvas do not violate the precepts even in their minds. After that, the body and mind experience keen and thorough absorption. My body and mind were extremely comfortable and blissful. This is the foremost method. The Dharma door of holding the precepts to cultivate the body is the number one way, in my opinion. Sutra. Great Maud Gyalayana arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, "Once, when I was out on the road begging for food, I met the three Kashyapa brothers, Uruvilva, Gaya, and Nadi, who proclaimed for me the first commons profound principle of causes and conditions. I immediately brought forth resolve and obtained a great understanding." Commentary: Great Ma Udgalayana rose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, "Ma Udgalayana's name means descended from bean gatherers." He said, "Once, when I was out on the road begging for food, I met the three Kashyapa brothers, Uruvilva, Gaya, and Nadi. Uruvilva's name means Papa." Yang Grove, 
and he got the name because he had a growth on his body that was shaped like a, a papaya. Gaia was named after a mountain. Nadi was named after a river. The three brothers proclaimed for me the first common profound principle of causes and conditions. They discussed the Buddha's Dharma specifically the doctrine of causes and conditions. That is, I say that the dramas which arise from conditions are all empty, that they are all also given the name falseness, and that they are known as the meaning of the middle way. When they elaborated on this meaning, I immediately brought forth resolve and obtained a great understanding. Earlier, Shariputra had heard the ear both first had become enlightened and had been certified to the first stage of Ahatshi. He returned to his living quarters and told Maudgalayana, I encountered some bishops today who are disciples of the Buddha. They spoke a verse for me. When Shariputra repeated the verse for Mahamaudgalayana, he too became enlightened. The two of them then went together to take refuge with the Buddha and bow to him as their teacher. Some say that Shariputra encountered the Bishu Yashvayit who spoke this verse for him. All dhammas arise from conditions. All dhammas is because of conditions. The Buddha, the great Sramana, often spoke of this. They say this. They say that this verse brought about Shariputra's awakening. In general, he heard the disciples talking about the drama of causes and conditions and became enlightened, as did Maudgalayana. The profound principle refers to dharmas used to teach bodhisattvas. Dharma used for a heart would be shallow principles. The profound principles then are the state of the great vehicle. Sutra, the first command accepted me, and the kashaya, kashaya was on my body, and my hair fell out by itself. I ran in the ten directions. Having no impeding obstructions, I discovered my spiritual penetrations, which are esteemed as unsurpassed, and I accomplished a hardship. Commentary The first command accepted me, and the kashaya, kashaya was on my body. When I arrived at the Buddha's place, he said, It's good you've come, be sure, let your hair fall by itself, and the kashaya cloth you. By the power of the Buddha's spiritual penetrations, Maudgalayana's hair and beard fell away at those words. In those times, when someone decided to leave home, they did so immediately. They didn't stop to think it over. They were not like people of today who can never make up their minds. When Maudga Yayana's hair and beard fell out, he assumed the appearance of a big shoe. He realized around in the ten directions, having no impending obstructions. Maudga Yayana was foremost in spiritual penetrations. After he left the home life, he obtained spiritual powers that allowed him to go to all the walls of the ten directions and perform changes and transformations at will. His spiritual penetrations were unhindered. I discovered my spiritual penetrations, which I esteemed as unsurpassed, and I accomplished a hardship. Sutra, not only the world honored one, but the first commands of the ten directions praise my spiritual powers as perfectly clear and pure, masterful and fearless. Commentary, not only the world honored one, but the first command of the ten directions that praise my spiritual powers. It's not just the world honored one, Shakyamuni Buddha, who praises me. The first commands of the ten directions acclaim my spiritual penetrations and wonderful functioning. They command them as perfectly clear and pure, masterful and fearless. Sutra, the Buddha asks about perfect penetration by means of a spiral-like attention to the profound, the light of my mind was revealed. Just as the muddy water clears, eventually it became pure and dazzling. This is the foremost method. Commentary The Buddha asked about perfect penetration. Now the Buddha is questioning his disciples 
each person who cultivates the way as to what particular skill they developed that brought about their enlightenment. By means of a spiral-like attention to the profound, I worked my way back to profound purity. Until the light of my mind was revealed, my mind emitted light just as the muddy water clears. It was just like letting the bit water settle until it becomes pure. Eventually, it became pure and dazzling. When it had settled long enough, it was naturally clear and sparkling. This is the foremost method. I cultivated the skill of spiraling back to the profundity of the nature of the treasury of the first common. This is the best way.